We have come to our third and final introductory moral theory in the class, utilitarianism, and uh, there's really only three topics to cover uh, in uh, before we start this section. So uh, first we're going to cover what is consequentialism and what is utilitarianism. Second, we're going to cover the social uh, aspirations of the historical utilitarians. And third, we're going to talk about Mill's uh, audience and his writing style for this book that we're going to read. So first, uh, we've covered two broad sorts of moral theories so far, virtue ethics and deontology. Virtue ethics in Aristotle is concerned with sort of what kind of person ought you to be? What does a virtuous person uh, look like? How should you live your life uh, in light of the importance of virtue? That was one kind of ethical theory. Another kind we looked at is deontology, as instantiated by Kant. He's focused on what are our moral duties, uh, what, how can we describe morality as a series of uh, duties that you have to live up to. The consequentialist view on morality is a third kind of way of approaching morality. The consequentialist says, I'm not uh, centrally interested in what kind of person you should be. I'm not centrally interested in what the shape of your moral duties are. I'm centrally interested in uh, what is the goal of morality? What is morality trying to achieve? What are we trying to do when we act morally? And so the consequentialist says that is what determines morality. It's the goal of morality, what we're trying to achieve, specifically the consequences. So the good consequences are what we're trying to achieve and the bad consequences are what we're trying to avoid. Morality is about getting good things to happen and stopping bad things from happening. It's not about being a good person, although a good person will get good things to happen and will stop bad things from happening. So it's not like virtue is irrelevant to the consequentialist. You should be virtuous. But the reason you should be virtuous is because you will achieve good consequences. It's not like duties are irrelevant to the consequentialist. They say, look, you do have a duty. You have a duty to bring about good consequences and to prevent bad consequences. That's what your duty is. And so maybe that duty breaks down into lots of other duties. I don't know, maybe you have a duty to donate money to charity because this will bring about good consequences. But centrally what's important is not the fact that you have a duty, it's the fact that there are good consequences that we should bring about and bad consequences that we should prevent. So that's the kind of consequentialist approach to morality. It's probably the simplest kind of approach to morality. It just says, look, find out what's good and then morality is based on what's good. But if you think about it, that's kind of what Aristotle was doing. We started with, uh, for Aristotle, what is a good human life? What is eudaimonia? What does everybody aim at? We started for Kant with what is good. He, the very first sentence in the groundwork is the only thing that's good without reservation is a good will. So consequentialism is a bit more specific. It's not just what is good. It's basically starting with the assumption that consequences are good. Or maybe I shouldn't say assumption. It's not like consequentialism is just built on an assumption. But basically, the consequentialist is somebody who's interested in consequences centrally. So that's consequentialism. We're reading a book called Utilitarianism, which is not named consequentialism. So what does utilitarianism have to do with consequentialism? So consequentialism you can think of as like a broad circle or a broad concept. All moral systems concerned centrally with consequences are consequentialist. Utilitarianism is a kind of consequentialism. So it's a subset of the circle, so a smaller circle inside the larger circle. The utilitarian says, I'm a consequentialist, and the consequence that I care about is utility. What is utility? Well, we're going to see Mill propose his understanding of utility, according to which utility is uh, pleasure and lack of pain. There are other utilitarians who have different understandings of utility. The most common is uh, preference utilitarians. They say utility is satisfying preferences and, uh, well, yeah, satisfying preferences and preventing the frustration of preferences. We're not going to read that kind of utilitarianism. We're going to read Mill, Mill's utilitarianism, where utility is pleasure and lack of pain. But uh, that's what the utilitarians are. And usually when we describe utilitarianism, it's two things. It's the view that the consequences that matter are utility, and then also it's a view about what should we do about uh, utility. So basically, should we maximize utility? And that's what the utilitarian tends to say. Uh, that'll come up in Mill, too, so we'll see this as we read uh, chapter 2. 
So that's consequentialism, and that's utilitarianism. It's the third kind of moral theory we're looking at. Number two, uh, the social aspirations of the utilitarian. So consequentialism is a very big circle. Utilitarianism is a smaller circle. Utilitarianism kind of officially gets its start uh, with three main people. Uh, there are a few utilitarians, but there's three main ones, Jeremy Bentham, John James Mill, and John Stuart Mill, who is the child of James Mill. And these three and the basic group that uh, they were in at the time, they had uh, sort of social aspirations in the sense that they wanted to reform society, like lots of people want to reform society, and they thought utilitarianism could be a very helpful tool for reforming society. So they thought, look, all this moral debate that's been going on for thousands of years, as Mill will point out in chapter one of this book, uh, it's really getting us nowhere we need. Uh, to be more sensible about how we're doing things, especially when we're thinking about things on a very large scale. So this is at the time, this is the uh, 19th century when the British Empire is uh, quite large and doing all sorts of things all around the world, including in India. And so the thought is that, look, we're having these large scale, oh, and they're all British. We're having these large scale effects on the world. There's lots of stuff going on and we need some sort of principled way to make decisions about how to run society. Uh, we need to run society in a moral way, not in an immoral way. We need to have a good society. And we need to do this on a principled basis. We need right and wrong answers. And philosophy is just, it's not giving us clear enough guidance on what we should do. But you know what is making a lot of progress right now? It's the social sciences. So the social sciences are sort of newly emerging or flourishing in this time. Uh, the utilitarians and Bentham and stuff, they're sort of in this tradition of what's known as positivism, which is associated uh, mostly with August Comte, a uh, French guy. And the thought from the positivists and the social scientists more broadly is that, look, we're starting to learn about how society works and the principles according to which uh, human beings behave in large groups and things like this. We're learning how diseases spread. We're learning uh, how, uh, you know, different social rules uh, have different outcomes. We're learning about what causes poverty and what causes crime and what causes suicide and all this, these things. And so the thought is that what we should be doing is really we should be running society in like a scientific manner. We should be figuring out what's going to uh, produce the best outcomes. And we do that by doing science. And then we implement that via policy. So how should we run prisons or things like this? Well, we should sort of do a bunch of science to figure out how do prisons function? Like what's the best way to set up, a, set up a prison and then do that. And so for the utilitarian, there's the moral philosophy part, which is saying what's important is increasing utility. Like that's what matters most. But then what is going to increase utility? That's not really a problem for the philosopher. The philosopher just tells you, look, increase utility. That's the moral thing to do. And then to find out how to do that, you ask the social scientists. So the thought is that utilitarianism could sort of form a basis for a rational form of government, for a form of government that benefited everybody, or at least benefited people the most possible, which would bring the greatest happiness to society. It could eliminate disease and poverty and all these things. We would just study what causes disease, what causes poverty, what causes all these social ills, figure out what causes them, figure out what policies will get rid of them, and implement those policies. So that's the hope. Utilitarianism is a moral theory, just like Aristotle's moral theory and Kant's moral theory and every other moral theory. So it is telling you and I what to do. But the aspirations of the utilitarians were larger than just a sort of individualistic moral theory. They were thinking on a society-wide level. And Aristotle had society-wide views. We didn't read those. Those were in his politics. Kant had society-wide views. We didn't read those. Those are in the first half of the Metaphysics of Morals and some other stuff. The utilitarians, uh, the society-wide stuff is a little more linked up with uh, their moral theory. And so they're thinking in sort of broad terms and not just individualistic terms. And so uh, I bring this up for two reasons. One, it's sort of just an interesting historical context to have in mind as you're reading. And number two, it illustrates an important point, which is we always have to keep in our heads distinct what are non-philosophy questions and what are philosophy questions. And the utilitarians were very clear that Morality is a philosophy question to the extent that we determine that happiness is what matters or utility is what matters. 
So that, of course, is a job for philosophers. John Stuart Mill's a philosopher, and he's writing a philosophy book about this. But then everything after that, what do we do to increase utility? How, what, what does it take? That's not a job for philosophers. We leave that to the social scientists. And so that's uh, a very important division that the utilitarians had in mind, and we don't want to get confused and think that the job of the moral philosopher, according to the utilitarian, is to like design society or something. No, you leave that to the technocrats, effectively, the bureaucrats who can figure out the right way to do things. Uh, third, just a quick point about the audience and the writing style. So unlike Aristotle, uh, which we read basically his lecture notes for a course that he taught, unlike Kant, where we read a very complicated philosophical text that he wrote for like five people, basically, uh, Mill's utilitarianism was published in a literary magazine in uh, installments. And so he was writing for a general audience, a very educated general audience, but still a general audience. And so uh, I think it's helpful to keep this in mind because some of his objections and some of the ways he frames his opponents and some of the arguments he makes are a little uh, <laughs> like spicy. They're a little... Um, uncharitable, they're a little fast. He spends a lot of time beating up uh, basically people who don't know what they're talking about. He says, oh, you might think utilitarianism means this, and it's just some stupid thing that, like, why would you think utilitarianism means this? But it's because he's writing for a general audience, so he's the sort of misunderstandings that he's trying to combat are not really misunderstandings that a lot of philosophers would have. They're misunderstandings that a typical person would have about utilitarianism. So if you're trying to understand why is Mill talking about people who think utilitarianism is just like this silly thing, it's because he's writing for a general audience. Now, of course, they're an educated general audience, and also I think you pitched it a little too complicated, so it is like a philosophical text, just like uh, Kant's and Aristotle's. Um, but sometimes when he sort of dips into what seems like sort of unnecessarily harsh language or things like that, that's because he's writing to keep normal people interested and because he's going after views that normal people have, which are maybe not so good. So um, have fun. Oh, I guess I didn't talk about writing style also. Like he's, <laughs> we're reading, uh, so we read Aristotle and Kant in translation, of course. We're not reading the original text from Mill. We're reading something close to the original text. It's a simplification in some ways. Um, Mill is just, uh, I think he's a bad writer. And so this makes it a bit, well, bad, and that's not fair. Mill writes in a way that you have to get used to, especially if you didn't haven't read a lot of 19th century texts. Uh, so uh, we're taking a simplified version because because there's no translation going on. You're not losing a lot when we like simplify things down. Um, the ideas are basically the same. So hopefully you find this version that we're reading uh, more or less manageable.